Okay, hey, Chris. Thanks a bunch for doing this interview uh, with us for the Accessible Home Summit of Experts. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Thank well, you for inviting me. I can't think of a better guy to have on. Folks, I want you to meet Chris Diaz. Chris uh, is an expert accessible home specialist, and you'll love what he brings to the table. Uh, Chris, as you know, the object of these interviews is to bring to light the huge need of, of the many with physical challenges. And because of what you've gone through, I really can think of nobody better than you and to enlighten us and teach us all kinds of information that has taken you a long time to both understand and implement. So can you give me, uh, give us a little background of, of what happened to you and where you came from and what's going on today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm uh, I, I roughly six years ago, I had a spinal cord uh, injury. And prior to that, I was a commercial industrial electrician. I lived on my own. And uh, one night I got up to go to the bathroom and uh, I fell uh, backwards into the bathtub. I believe I fainted. And uh, that, that earlier that evening, I was with uh, my mother and um, I left my phone with her. So when work called the next day that I didn't show up, she said, I'll go check on him. And then with the concierge, they uh, opened my door. The chain was on it. I called up for help a couple of times. And uh, the concierge said he couldn't open the door, that they'd have to get the police. And my mother said, I've never heard my son call for help. And she kicked the door off the chain and uh, opened it. And that's how I was rescued. I had been there for about 15 to 16 hours on my own. So during that course at that time, what were you thinking? Uh, mainly I was just trying to keep my airway open. I was in a funny position and I just kept trying uh, to say to myself, uh, just keep breathing. You know, someone's going to find you. Someone's going to find you. And, uh, I never once thought that I was going to die, but, uh, in reality, between the time my mother had a conversation with the concierge guy and I called out for help when I heard her voice, I actually, uh, cut off the air. Because uh, I stopped keeping my airway open and my eyes turned back and I turned blue. And so I was pretty close to, to death. But I, I never thought that I was going to die. Well, that's, uh, that's unbelievable. You know, when you were you went from completely mobile to relatively completely immobile overnight. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, I was the, I did everything on the fly. I did 10 things at the same time. And <laughs> uh and um, yeah, it's complete uh, 180 to not to, to relying on everybody for just about everything in the beginning. It was it was difficult. All right, so you're going through all this. Your first emotions when you were able to to get out of the tub and you were able to to at least have some semblance of life uh, living. What what was going through your head? You mean like uh, in the ICU or like when I finally ended up getting home? You know, actually, anywhere in that, Chris. What what was, you know, what was yeah. going through your mind? Yeah, I mean, it didn't really hit home because I, I kept uh, believing rehab. Everybody kept talking about rehab, rehab. So in my head, I was like, I'll just gonna go to rehab and I'll be fine, you know. And uh, I really didn't want to believe uh, what the doctors were were saying. And then, of course, things start to sink in, and then that's where. Uh, the disbelief, the crying, the anger, and and uh, everything starts really hitting home, and uh, and you start having to deal with stuff. So, what were some of those fears you were facing? How was I going to create an income for myself? How I would feed myself? Who would take care of me? Who would live with me? How would I do things? Uh, everyday things. How would I get a drink of water? How would I get in my door? There was like so much everything is just imagine being in the middle of your life and all of a sudden you know nothing about how to live life and that's the position that I found myself in so what uh what did you do what steps did you take to confront those fears uh rehab really helped and uh that started teaching me really some basic skills about just how to feed myself and um and then figure out a way of how to get uh, hydrate, just how to have water. And um, the biggest uh, thing that I could do, I guess, for my fears is to be around other people 
that were in that were wheelchair users and to see what solutions they came up with and see what they were struggling with. And uh, just to try to reintegrate it to society. So I did a ton of volunteering. I did a lot of public speaking and that seemed to be therapeutic to find purpose and to, to find uh, you know your little spot back in the community. So give me a time frame on that. So you came you, you went, came out of the ICU to where you started to think like that, to where you started to to help others, to be able to give your give them a perspective on what you went through and how to solve some of those problems. Uh, yeah. So ICU is about four months on a ventilator, on uh, feeding tubes, and then uh, there was about another five months of just general hospital care. And then a year of rehab. So we're at like almost the, the two year mark. And then that's the two year mark is where I started year and a half where I started um, volunteering. And uh, once that gave me a little bit of confidence to be around people. And I started to realize that, hey, I have an opportunity here to, um, to do anything that I really want. You know, and I wasn't going to let my circumstances stop being who I was before my accident. And uh, when I, once I started changing my thinking that uh, things are possible, and that's when um, I started to create ideas and think about work and think about solutions. And my electrical mind started where I had a lot of time. So I just Googled just about everything and, uh, and started putting stuff together. You know, ever since ever since we started talking, I've been pretty blow, blown away by a lot of your stuff. Now, the, the ability to overcome is I've seen it in some and uh, in you. It's been remarkable to to see where you went. You know, I'm a, I'm a contractor. Right. So the electrician side of you and I know that if if you were doing what you say you were doing, how busy you were, then to go from there to here. And now be able to take that mind of yours to create all the stuff that you're going to talk to us a little bit about. That, that to me was, that, that's what this whole thing is about. Who can you bring up from the depths of, of depression and find a way to help them get a life that, that, makes, that has meaning? So, okay. So you did all this and then you started a business. Uh, you started to create things. What, give us a perspective on that. Uh, originally the products that I created were, were simply for myself. So, uh, my first product was actually a, a voice activated door opener. So I, I simply Googled some existing, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And, uh, so I Googled some smart devices that were already on the market. And then using my electrical background, I mated those to my, uh, to the controls in my mechanical door opener and called one of my electrician buddies and said, attach this wire to this, this wire to that, make this over here and <laughs> plug it all in. And, uh, and it worked right off the hop. So the first was the door opener and that came from uh, being in bed and not being able to answer my door, like whether it's in the morning or to get my medication or just to let somebody in at night to help me. So the door mounted with a security camera now it didn't really matter where I was in my unit, if I was in my chair or if I was in bed, I could simply look on the iPad or my phone, see who's outside, call out to Google, boom, door open. And uh, even more importantly, I started to find other uses for it. So when I was out in the community and I knew I had medications being dropped off or supplies being dropped off, I was no longer had to stay hostage until I got my delivery. I could now go out, run my errands, be with my friends, be with my family. When I see the delivery person, verify who he is, click the door open, they drop off the stuff, the door closes behind them, sends me a verification, and I'm living life and my injury all of a sudden has minimized because I can still do what I want to do. That's awesome, buddy. All right, so I know that was one of your inventions and, and <laughs> there's so many people that need what you've got. There, oh my God, this is going to really enlighten a lot of people here. Play, okay, I can tell you that. So, all right, that that's some good stuff. All right, so you started this business, 
and and you created websites. You did a lot of stuff that which we'll talk about later. But what got you really motivated to get to get in that business world and to and to take it to another level? Yeah, I, I was always uh, well as an electrician. I, I worked for myself a lot, and as as an electrician, if you don't solve the problem, you don't get paid, right? So you're you're kind of forced to be solution oriented and get things done. Otherwise you've done nothing. And part of me uh, creating this stuff, it was also a lot of fear. I didn't want to be remembered for only my accident. And uh, somebody said something to me, you know, everybody's got a disability, essentially. The only difference is people can see yours, right? And you're sitting uh, in it. So don't, don't use that as an excuse, like do what you want to do. And, and that started uh, just getting the ideas. And I, as I tried a little bit of this, tried to look into how to build a website, look at how to build a solution for my door, slowly these things a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And I started getting confidence. And, and until the day was like, every time somebody saw my door opener, they're like, I need that, I need that. And I'm walking, where can I get that? And I started, hey, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something here. And, that builds the confidence and, uh, and all these little steps, when you string them together, they become a, a final product. All right, so I know that the door opener was like one of your first, first deals. Give us a couple more uh, things that you've done to uh, make life easier for those that are, have got these challenges. Uh, yeah, so after that, I created a, a height adjustable table and uh, you may say to yourself, well, there's many height adjustable tables on the market, but the particular one that I created, it only has one column. So it lifts from either uh, from the edge of the table, which leaves almost 365 degrees open underneath. So now I could have three people in a wheelchair at my table. I could have my niece in her high chair at my table. I could have uh, one part of my table set up for work and the other part of my table set up for eating. So now I'm no longer tied to my attendant and having to eat at six o'clock every day or five o'clock. I could set it up. And then when I'm ready to switch over, when I'm finished my thoughts, I could eat when I want. I could go back to work. And that helps the independence and the quality of life. So the table uh, was another huge one also because People in wheelchairs, they tend to be hunched forward because they're not always eating in the correct position or looking at their iPad or computer. So now when I eat, I can bring my table lower. When I, uh, I'm working on my iPad, I can bring it up so that my shoulders are always in the correct position and I don't get all that neck pain and, and fatigue. That's pretty cool. What else you got? Uh, and then uh, another one is the cup holder. So I, I don't know if the listeners know, but I, I have limited hand function. So I can just hook things with my thumb. I have a little bit of tenodesis grip, but I, most cup holders on the market were on the perimeter of the chair and they always seem to get knocked off when I go through a door or an elevator. This has a little tongue, it slides underneath, underneath the, the cushions of either power or manual chairs. And I can hook my thermos with my thumb and uh, independently just drink water, coffee, beer, whatever, whatever you fancy. Well, we'll have a beer. How's that? Yeah, it's done. It's done. All right. So, all right. That's, that's, that's all cool. And, and there's so many more things you've done. But what I really found fascinating also was that you're working for the Rick or, or have worked through the Rick Hansen Foundation scenario. Can you give us, which is big in Canada. Okay, and, and for those of us in the States that don't know who Rick Hansen is, can you give us a perspective on that whole thing that you've gone through? Yeah, so really quick, Rick is uh, Canada's most decorated paraplegic athlete. He did the Man in Motion Tour, which uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, he went around the world in a wheelchair and created this movement for removing barriers. And he created a course on identifying uh, barriers in construction in the built environment. And these barriers are uh, for people with vision loss, people with hearing loss, and people with mobility issues. 
So he created a course. I've taken his course. And now I can go out to public spaces like community centers, YMCAs, uh, churches, uh, community centers, office buildings. And I do my rating and I give them a score on accessibility for vision loss, hearing loss, and mobility. And with some short-term recommendations and long-term recommendations on how they can become more accessible. And you could transfer this knowledge over, of course, to individuals in homes, am I correct? Yeah, there's a, there's a section in there for residential units. Uh, and then within the residential units, there's a section in kitchens, there's a section in washrooms, there's a section um, uh, and, and just regular uh, living spaces, I guess. All right, so what do you feel like is the biggest benefit that uh, the accessibility community, the people that have this need, can come out of the work that you've done with us? Yeah, so everybody uh, in construction says, yeah, we, we've built uh, the accessibility to code. This is to code, the most current code. But if you're in construction and you're familiar with code, codes are bare minimums. They are by far the most ideal situation. So what this uh, rating that I do in the suggestions, these are the gold standard of accessibility. So it goes above and beyond what you would get in code and kind of really sets the bar high and lets people know that when they arrive on one of these sites or one of these homes that's been Rick Hansen um, consulted on, that they're going to be able to access all the facilities, all the levels, all the uh, services offered in, uh, in a meaningful way. It's pretty impressive stuff, but Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to do it. It's I've learned so much and a lot of it I live every day. So it's not stuff that I have to memorize, but just seeing how important it is for other disabilities, vision loss. And that goes uh, when construction, like a lot of the stuff like that gets missed. And, and hearing loss is one of the biggest unreported disabilities out there. It also carries the most stigma because everybody's like, no, I can hear just fine. I can hear just fine. But there's, there's so many people with hearing loss, right? It's so important. Yeah, I have a dad that, uh, you, you, you from a, uh, you know, he's a good looking guy, right? And he's got that stigma that he doesn't want these things to show the, the earbuds that are going to enhance his ability to hear. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty amazing to me that people have that ego problem and it's, it's out there, man. So anyways, that, I like that a lot. Give me, give me an idea on how you see these products, these smart home deals, and anything involving what you're doing, how that's gonna be intersecting in the next 10 years of, of, uh, of our existence, what that's gonna mean, how we're gonna do it, and what do you see happening? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, my products are my products, but I think um, with the rating systems, they're, they're very um, detailed. And there, there's uh, assessors throughout Canada that are all doing the same work. And this is going to build up a bank of data on accessibility with a score attached to it. And eventually, they'll be able to compile this data and be like, hey, in the built environment, it looks like staircases are always failing because they don't have tactile indicators at the top, at the landing, and at the bottom. It looks like reception desks are failing because there's no hearing loop, you know, but we're doing great on elevators. We're doing great on ramps. So when it comes time to make new legislation, they're going to take this data and that's where they're going to start putting in code and being like, from now on, anywhere that there's service, a service or a information being a transaction happening, you need a hearing loop. Anytime you build a staircase, uh, there needs to be tactile indicators at the top, landing and at the bottom. So they're going to use this data for legislation. And because right now there's very little, there's very little data on real world accessibility. So this is just the first step in compiling that. And uh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Go ahead. Sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah. So um, 
if that happens again, my apologies. But uh, yeah, they're going to use, uh, uh, hopefully use this data to, for legislation. And then in my heart, without giving away too much, I feel that they're going to need somebody to help put this legislation together. And maybe that's going to be the next step in my career. And that will help Canadians and, maybe, and hopefully people in the North America and the U.S., by uh, pushing this accessibility legislation. Yeah, that's a, that's a tremendous goal. You know, I, 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 every day now I'm facing the challenge of getting this word out there. And by you doing what you're doing, by us doing what we're doing down here, it's going to make a hell of a difference. And that's the whole purpose of this thing. So, all right. So we go through this, all the stuff that you're going through, what you and I are going through. We've talked about inaccessible homes. And I, let's talk about Southwest Florida for a second, because I know you want to come down to vacation down here and have some yeah. fun. Definitely. And I, I can tell you, Chris, it's just in, incredible to me that there's virtually no accessible homes. Um, there's a guy named Gene Lever, who's a part of this, uh, uh, this summit. And Gene uh, built a home down here to, he's been in a chair since he was 19. He's in his late fifties now, same concept. And he had to build one because he couldn't find one. We did a great job and it was fantastic. But imagine all the people, whether you're a senior or you have physical challenges or whatever it may be, looking to live in a, a, a little bit better uh, climate that can't find these homes. And you and I have talked about putting a home together uh, from a vacation standpoint. And are you still uh, considering something like that? Yeah, well, um, my goals right now are to come down to Florida in November. And, uh, and of course, I'd like to meet up with you and we can discuss that. But yeah, I am definitely uh, would like to build an accessible uh, home that can be airbnb uh, with others and just let them really try and showcase that um, accessibility in the home doesn't have to look institutional. It can right. still be stylish and you don't really need things that they don't need to look whatever that is, quote unquote, accessible. You know, it can just pretty much look like a rip. But when you start scratching the surface, oh, that makes sense. That's why that's like that. Well, that's why like, you know, but at first glance, it would look just like a conventional home. Absolutely. We're calling it universal design in this case. So so yeah. you're going to be a, a main player in that, in developing a lot of these homes. We currently are, uh, are marketing uh, to folks that would want to build a barrier for universal design home. So that can fall right into line with this, which would be fantastic. All right. So where can people find you? Where can they get access to your products? How are you going to uh, uh, enable the person to be able to get in touch with you? Give me some, give me some websites, give me some, some contact information so we can get you out there. Yeah, you can, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn under, uh, my first and last name, Chris Stigas. So C-H-R-I-S-S-T-I-G-A-S. Uh, and then you can find my company's called Handy Help uh, Accessible Innovations, but uh, online you can find it at uh, www.handyhelp.ca. And that's uh, handy with an I, not a, not a Y. That's all one word. Um, and as far as the door openers i have installers that uh, are across the u.s so if uh, they call i can have somebody come out give them a quote for the mechanical part of the door opener and then the voice activated part the table is out of a place in texas and i have a contact there so i can uh, connect people for the table and the cup holder you can uh, find that online at uh, handicup.com wonderful all right, so lastly, if there's one thing that you could do to affect change in the world today, what would that be? Wow, great question. Um, I think, I think uh, simply uh, being in business and something as simple as just being in business and being out to restaurants um, to eat really showcases other people that people with disabilities, they are also out every single night. They're also out in restaurants. And hey, you need to step up your entrance game. You need to step up your washroom game. You need to step up 
you know, how you think about uh, accessibility because uh, more and more people uh, that are, are, are going are going to need uh, accessibility features. So just the work that I'm doing through the ratings and just simply being present in my community and, and showing people that, you know, that that shouldn't be a barrier. You know, it's interesting that you said you said the uh, the the ability to for the for the owners of restaurants in this particular case to understand that there are a lot of people out there that would utilize that restaurant if they knew that it was accessible, if they knew that they had the, all the things they need to be able to go in there comfortably. And it's so true in general regarding the real estate market. Think about that, you know, uh, that to be able to have an accessible home, not only that that's universal design that doesn't look in the quotes handicap, that opens up the doors to more buyers than they normally would, um, because now these these folks with ac accessible needs would look to that particular home to buy. So it kind of all ties in, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I hear people that are looking to buy homes, and they want homes that are a single floor, no steps, because they realize that they're getting older and they don't know where they're going to be. That's right. And even even our own government in construction. I mean, the code is the code, but they've also mandated that moving forward in all residential condos, in all subdivisions, 10% of the units need to be accessible, whether it's a townhome, a house, a condo. So they realize that they can't sustain uh, building these buildings and just putting everybody with wheelchairs or accessibility needs in one building. Like that's not a quality of life. That's not sustainable. That's not inclusive. And, and they're starting to realize that they need to mix with the community. So uh, it's at least in Toronto, it's heading that way with 10% of all new builds needing to be accessible. Wise words, bud. Well, hey, man, I want to thank you. It's been, a, it's been a real joy to be able to talk this stuff through with you. And um, I know what you're doing. I know how hard you work. I know how motivated you are. And I guarantee you that the people that have listened today have gotten a tremendous impact from your words. So thanks, Chris. My pleasure, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you to everybody listening. You take care, man. Okay. Have a good day.